For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to the Gist on Strat News Global. I'm Surya Gangadharan, and this evening we're going to look at some developments related to the coronavirus. And not so much the uh, virus as such, but at the uh, uh, at some of the data and the uh, extrapolations made based on the data. And uh, my guest is Professor Manindra Agrawal uh, of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, IIT Kanpur. Uh, welcome, Professor Manindra. Glad to have you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I'm going to begin with um, uh, thing, something called Sutra. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically a mathematical model developed by Professor Agarwal uh, and some other experts, uh, which basically uh, helps, uh, uh, I mean, just to break down the acronym, it stands for Susceptible Undetected Tested and Removed Approach. That's Sutra. It is a mathematical model for pandemics, it tracks the progress of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the model draws on COVID data generated by the government. And uh, on the basis of this, we're going to talk to uh, Professor Mandra Garwal about uh, what conclusions we can draw from uh, the data so far generated and applied on this mathematical model. So, Professor Agarwal, have you been able to make any projections on how the new Omicron variant could behave? Well, we, what we have done is, uh, uh, since the Omicron has, uh, was first reported in South Africa and uh, its impact is being seen there at the moment, so we looked at the South African data, applied this Sutra model there, and what we learned from after application of the model was that there is a parameter of the model called contact rate that measures how fast an infection is spreading. So that contact rate uh, doubled, in fact, slightly more than doubled. And uh, so that's one uh, learning we had from there. The second one was that uh, uh, there was a period of time in September, October, where seemingly the mutant was present in South Africa, but in cases, numbers were still going down, mm -hmm. which uh, we can explain the, through the model why that was happening because the susceptible population available for the mutant to spread was very, very small. And that population increased only in November and that is why the numbers started climbing up. So yeah. what this also told us was that uh, natural immunity, which in South Africa is at somewhere around 80% at the moment, is not being substantially bypassed by this mutant. So we just applied these two learnings to India and made certain assumptions that one, the uh, Omicron has already arrived here and it started to spread in December. Second, uh, that uh, natural immunity that exists in the country, again, at very high level, more than 80%, that is not significantly bypassed. Uh, the vaccine-induced immunity may get bypassed, but not the natural immunity. And based on that, we did the projections. So what came out was that uh, there will be a mild third wave, somewhat similar to the first wave. And uh, the South African data or observation at the moment is suggesting that the, most of the cases are quite mild. And, uh, mm -hmm. So we can hope that something similar will happen in India also. So overall, things do not look uh, concerning at the moment. Mm -hmm. Would you say the um, uh, health makeup in the health profile of uh, South Africa and South Africans is roughly parallel to India and Indians? Yes, yeah, South Africa also has a, a large fraction of young people and so does India. So in that sense, uh, there are similarities. And, uh, so we, since it's kind of, uh, you know, so similarities are certainly far more between India and South Africa than say India and Germany or India and Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's your reading that the Omicron variant will not be as severe as the Delta variant was. Well, that is what it appears at the moment. Uh, we must also say that uh, the situation is continuously evolving. Yeah. You would like to see more information from South Africa, especially the hospitalization cases there are rising. But are they going to rise as fast as in the case of Delta? Evidence so far seems to suggest no, but we just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Would you say, would you be able to um, uh, plot the trajectory of the Delta variant? Yeah, that we did uh, already at the beginning of the year. And we were continuously monitoring uh, how the Delta is going through the country. And uh, uh, we there was a period of time where we could not get it right because we never expected uh, Delta to be so infectious. Mm -hmm. But after some time when we learned enough about the mutant, then we could get the trajectory almost correct. Mm -hmm. So based on uh, how does Sutra, um, I presume Sutra will be able to help the government formulate strategies to deal with uh, Omicron and perhaps even subsequent uh, variants? Well, uh, one must keep in mind that modeling efforts are uh, just that. I mean, it's uh, as somebody said a uh, long time ago, all models are wrong, <laughs> but some models are useful. <laughs> so whenever we look at a model and prediction based on the model, that needs to be borne in mind that, uh, see, after all, we are trying to capture a very complex natural phenomenon using some a number of simplifications. So the it's uh, if we get those simplifications right, then the model will be able to capture the, this complex natural phenomenon reasonably well. But if we get it wrong some at somewhere, then uh, the predictions will go off the chart. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, all our conclusions, prediction need to be taken with that caveat in mind that uh, it is an indicator, uh, perhaps a good indicator, but uh, one needs to be prepared that this may not be correct. Mm -hmm. Is Sutra unique, uh, Professor? Is it uh, unique to India? Are there similar models elsewhere? Well, this model is unique. That is, it's uh, developed by three of us. Uh, I have not come across a model which uh, uh, does something similar uh, elsewhere. One of the most important things that we do, as opposed to the, there exist multiple models for pandemic yeah. modeling, but there is a very important difference between what we do and what most of the others do. We, every model has a set of parameters which measure the, how the trajectory is pro progressing. One of them I mentioned, contact rate, which measures how fast the pandemic is spreading. Uh, most of the models uh, ca capture or estimate the values of these parameters, not through data, but through different methodologies. For example, to estimate the contact rate, they will look at the past uh, history of that region, of the Google mobility data of that region, the uh, you know population structure of that region, what is the location of different uh, the, uh, places or where the large congregations happen, like schools, malls, where are they placed? So they do a very complex uh, set of uh, efforts to estimate the yeah. contact rate and similarly for other parameters. Uh, whereas what we do is we simply take the daily new infection data and uh, we learn the value of the parameter of contact rate and others from the data itself. So that makes uh, our model more robust provided of course, that the data is reasonably okay. If mm -hmm. data is very erroneous, then of course, uh, what we learned is not very useful. Mm -hmm. So, um, drawing from the fact that we already had uh, a very severe wave, uh, 
Delta, and we had another similar wave earlier than that. What are the lessons that can be drawn from the way government reacted to it? And, uh, you know, what are the lessons we can draw? It's very interesting analysis that uh, uh, can be done uh, for the past two waves. Uh, the first wave, uh, there was a very strict lockdown. Um, mm. And uh, while there may be multiple ways of looking at it, I think it's, it has to be kept in mind <coughs> Excuse me. that at that time, there was absolutely zero understanding of how this pandemic is going to behave. Yeah. Also, True. the country was completely unprepared. Even the PPE kits or medication were not clear. Hospitals were not ready. So keeping all that, those factors in mind, I think it was good that a very strict lockdown was imposed <clears throat> so that the numbers don't go up fast. And that's exactly what happened. <clears throat> the pandemic numbers started uh, sometime in March and it mm. kept on slowly rising until September and then peaked and then came down. Whereas for the second wave, things were much happened much faster because no strict lockdown was imposed. Different states imposed uh, their own levels of lockdowns. Yeah. And what our analysis shows is that uh, a very strict lockdown, uh, if you look at it uh, in a comprehensive sense, is not uh, a very good idea. A mid mild or medium level of lockdown, which allows... Mm -hmm most of the economic activity to continue is a good. It all, it helps to reduce the spread as well as you know, doesn't take away the livelihoods. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the points that um, keep coming up is how UP seems to have escaped the worst of this uh, coronavirus, you know, even the Delta variant. While uh, states like Kerala with their exemplary health systems have struggled, you know. Uh, even Maharashtra, for that matter, Pune was under uh, some kind of a lockdown for a long time. Uh, how do you, uh, you know, uh, contrast this? You know, how did UP get away so easily? How did they actually get away so easily? Yeah, there is. Uh, uh, it's a matter of uh, you no know, detailed analysis and investigation, and I hope that uh, some of uh, the scientists take it up. Uh, because we come it, at it from a purely mod, modeling perspective. So what yeah. we can do is we can analyze and say this is what it appears to be. But to verify it on the ground, one needs actually you know, to you know, uh, act, act at a much broader level. So what we observed was in, uh, indeed the uh, UP, except for a period of about two weeks uh, yeah. and after the beginning May, had kept the very good control on the pandemic, which was even more surprising because UP did not impose a strict lockdown. They actually allowed most of the economic activities to continue. Mm. So this was a bit of a mystery. So we actually uh, got in touch with the government of UP. They were uh, they shared a lot of data with us. And we actually did an analysis for UP, which uh, the result of that or consequence of that are uh, uh, there in the in a report we have prepared for UP. Uh, but uh, some interesting learnings from that are very briefly that uh, UP adopted a very strict uh, tracking and testing uh, methodology that uh, to continuously track the pandemic where it is going and and. Uh, try to address that. And they operationalize at every single village a committee, which was earlier created a few years ago to uh, track the Japanese encephalitis, which was uh, mm -hmm. quite uh, rapidly spreading in the eastern part of UP a few years ago. And these committees helped control that. And the same committees were pivoted to handle and track uh, COVID pandemic in their villages, a basic kits were given to every village, these committees to, you know, just keep monitoring villagers as soon as somebody develops symptoms and even before waiting for the test, they start the 
basic treatment. Mm -hmm. So all these things put together, while it infection did spread very significantly in the state because uh, the lockdown was not there. Yeah. But the severity was kept under check. Uh, I think we, we have observed that a very large uh, fraction of cases were asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic. So uh, it didn't cause that much damage as one had feared because the health infrastructure in UP is uh, even within the country is not amongst the best ones. Yeah. So the population is huge. So it was really a matter of concern that things can go wrong badly. Mm -hmm. And what did Kerala do wrong? Oh, well, Kerala did not do anything wrong. Uh, they adopted a different strategy. Uh, the strategy of UP and several other states was to not try to control the spread of the pandemic excessively. You know, you impose a strict lockdown that it controls the spread, yes. But uh, it comes at a cost. And the cost is what Kerala paid. in the During the first wave, they imposed a very strict lockdown. Everybody did, actually. But they were very successful in controlling the spread of the pandemic yeah. during the first wave. In fact, there was a time when, uh, you know, they had zero cases for an extended period of time. And, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, praise was given to the Kerala model where they could do that. Uh, while that success was very good at the time, but a downside of that success was that because it did, the pandemic did not spread, so the immunity level in the population was extremely low. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, then came the Delta. Now, Delta was a much faster spreading, more infectious mutant. And uh, the state could not control the spread. They imposed a strict lockdown, but Delta kind of bypassed that. And this is true in case of many other countries also. They have tried to impose a strict lockdown to control Delta, but not have been very successful. So when Delta started spreading fast in the state, uh, they could not control it. And... Uh, since the immunity level was very low in the population, they just had a much worse uh, situation and numbers kept on, uh, had a, kept on at a very high level. They did impose strict lockdown, so that did not have a, allow the pandemic to numbers to grow, blow up too much, but they continued for a very long time at a very large numbers. So that is the price they have paid in terms of uh, the success in the first uh, wave came back to make things difficult for them in the second wave. Mm -hmm. So it's a, I, I don't think one could tell say that they went wrong somewhere. It's just that uh, it happened uh, the way they did not anticipate and it was very hard to anticipate these things. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is lockdowns only postpone the inevitable. Lockdowns be yes, exactly. See, lockdowns should be imposed only when your health infra is exhausted and numbers, more numbers will make it collapse. That's the time to impose a lockdown. Otherwise, you should just have you know, put some restrictions. Just don't allow large congregations, especially in an enclosed space. And... Uh, Keep an eye on things, but otherwise, uh, you know, lockdowns. And this is uh, such, you know, learnings from all over the world. Look at Australia; they have been imposing lockdowns, trying to control the reach, yeah. uh, restrict, mm -hmm. restrict the pandemic from spreading, and they are still in the lockdowns. They are yeah. still struggling with it. New Zealand, same situation. I mean, there's all these countries which were hailed as the great success stories uh, yeah. some time ago are now kind of suffering from the consequences. Of course, they bet on the fact that once a vaccination happens, they won't need a lockdown and uh, the people will become immune. But unfortunately, the vaccines uh, are not helping that much in controlling the spread of the pandemic. While they are reducing the severity of the disease, 
they are not able to control the spread. Mm -hmm. Professor, would you say that uh, COVID is now getting endemic in India? Because I'm looking at all these elections uh, that are coming up, you know, and the huge crowds that are going to be there, and one just wonders, you know. Well, uh, we certainly are cautiously optimistic at this point in time, I would say, that it is reaching the endemic stage. Especially if Omicron turns out to be as it is being thought of, that it is fast spreading, but perhaps not as deadly as Delta. That and the given the fact that a very high level of immunity exists in our population, we should, uh, as I said, cautious, be cautiously optimistic that we are hitting the endemic stage. Well, now, regarding elections, uh, it's if the crowd, while do crowds do gather in elections, uh, keep in mind that most of the people who will come will already have immunity in them. And second, mm -hmm. these are election gatherings are all invariably in open spaces. Yeah. Where the transmission is uh, significantly less than in closed spaces. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the factors which have to be kept in mind. In fact, our study during the spread of Delta shows <clears throat> at that time also several states had elections. But uh, the study shows that uh, if we compare the states with elections and states without elections, the Delta spread characteristics in both types was almost the same. I so see. that uh -huh. suggests that uh, the the state elections or Kumbh Mela gathering or you know somewhere else other gatherings because these are all in open areas did not seem to have played a major role. Mm -hmm. So despite people being there in lakhs, the fact that they are in the open does mitigate the. Uh, yeah, that seems to be the case. I mean, it's again this is something which has been observed elsewhere. Also, see, recall. <clears throat> Last year in the US, while the cases were you know, rising, yeah. and there were large gatherings, uh, you know, this uh, agitations by a group of people protesting against uh, there was some killing of a mm -hmm. yeah. person of color. And then there was some, I uh, don't fully recall the details, but there was large scale mass gatherings in the U.S. in different cities, but these were mostly in the open areas. And you mm -hmm. see the case graph there, uh, there was not a very significant difference you know, because of that. And at that time also, it was being said these are gatherings in open area, so it will mitigate this uh, factor of people getting together. Mm -hmm. Last question, Professor. Uh, do you are you able to interact with um, uh, the academic uh, fraternity in other countries dealing with similar issues? Um, you know. Yeah, we we have a, a, we were quite I should say uh, busy if, with Delta when things were going uh, bad in the country, and then once the Delta subsided, then. Uh, you know, all three of us who are the authors of this paper, we were uh, we are not really in in the or rather our primary interest is not in the mathematical modeling yeah. of for the pandemic. We, we have different interests, but we had gotten together to develop this. So we got engaged with or busy with some certain other things. But anyway, now we have started the interaction with the communities in the US, particularly. There is a good community there. And they have their own models, and we had a very fruitful discussion some time ago with them. And we mm -hmm. decided to keep you know, interacting so that we learn from each other. Professor Agarwal, uh, pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for the insight. And uh, let's hope that uh, January, February, I think you had predicted uh, a lower than uh, a week peak or uh, yeah with something like around the first uh, peak of uh, intensity around the first wave mm -hmm. uh sometime in february that's our 
prediction well based on the assumption that omicron is already spreading in the country mm -hmm. uh, so maybe it, it will still take some more time but i think we can for now go ahead with this and of course we'll continuously update our <coughs> estimations based on what we learn yeah. great professor agrawal thank you very much again uh, pleasure talking to you sir thank you uh, and for all of you out there who are uh, tracking our shows on the gist uh, subscribe to our website subscribe to our uh, youtube channel uh, follow us on our website keep coming to us with your comments observations and questions uh, thank you and goodbye